Welcome. Thanks for being here. It's really a pleasure to have you all, and I'm really excited about tonight's event. Um, it's, I'm Gail Stearns. I'm the dean of the Wallace Allface Chapel, this beautiful building that we're sitting in here, the beautiful chapel. Um, you'll find that Chapman names everything, almost down to the seat that you're on. So Wallace Allface Chapel is inside the Yoder Sanctuary, which is inside the Fish Interface Center. And um, so we're just delighted to have you. And I hope you noticed the marquetry cabinets as you were walking in. One of those uh, contains a Book of Mormon. The, the uh, original print one is not in there. That's in the library archives, but we have, we have one, and we will bring it out for special occasions. There's a facsimile copy in there. Um, it's really, really wonderful to have you. And I want to say um, just a, a few words of thanks. And I'm not going to name everyone who's in the, the audience, but thank you, Larry, for being here and um, for uh, the partnership with the Witzel Foundation. And President Peters, thanks for being here. Um, there are books for sale. Julie's books are here. I just learned they're out in the um, foyer there. So afterward, if you'd like to buy one, um, I hope you're very strong because um, I handed this to um, uh, my, the manager of the Interface Center, Jennifer, today, and she was like, what? And so anyway, um, wonderful. I hope, I hope you get one. And Julie, I'm assuming, will be happy to sign those afterward. That'd be lovely. So um, you're welcome to pick one up after. And I want to share just a few words um, with you about this pretty magnificent volume that's in front of you. I'm going to tell you about that. And afterward, again, you're welcome to go look at that. This is, the, this is one of seven volumes of the St. John's Bible. Um, the St. John's Bible is actually the first handwritten, hand-illuminated Bible done since the invention of the printing press. It's a seven-volume work, so this is one of the volumes that contains the Gospels. It was done using medieval techniques. This was done um, by St. John's University in Minnesota. You may know that it's near, near, near Minneapolis. And um, the techniques included writing on calfskin vellum with Chinese calligraphy inks made in the 1870s use, using goose, swan, and turkey quills as pens. So the calligraphers... Um, were actually commissioned by the uh, calligrapher of the Queen of England, who created a special script and trained all these people to do it. And then um, they had a number of artists that that sat or, that worked with theologically um, with the themes and created the artwork for these Bibles. And they're just phenomenal. They're just magnificent. Um, what we have here is one of 299 full-size lithographic museum quality reproductions. With the art, the Bible actually exemplifies three 21st century ideals and invites us to rethink this ancient text. And I have to say, when I read these and when I think about it, it reminds me a lot of, um, of actually your book because some of these themes are highlighted in there as well. The Bible highlights and celebrates the lives and stories of women. That's one thing. Secondly, it lifts up the broad biblical ethic to include and care for those whom society has previously pushed to the margins. And finally, it celebrates science, technology, and discovery. So the illustrations, for example, will have DNA uh, in them, sort of molecules uh, worked into, um, into the illustrations. One of my favorites of all time is a, is a, is a verse where um, the, the verse is about forgiveness of sins. And worked into that illustration, if you look closely, are images of the Twin Towers. And the question is, how do we forgive? It's, it's pretty phenomenal when you look at the different kinds of things in there. And there are people from all cultures represented. So um, Chapman is raising funds for this seven volume set, uh, set. Nancy Brink would want me to share that with you, who is our director of church relations. Um, and what, what we're hoping is that we will be the stewards of one of those 299 sets. We have this one here with us for a year, and we're doing a lot of programming. and. Um, and I know that BYU owns a set. I don't know if you know that. That's one of the universities that does. And many, many universities and hospitals and institutions across the country are buying those. So anyway, we're pretty excited about it. You're welcome to come up. We'll have a student that can answer all your questions afterward if you want to look at it. And um, 
someday perhaps it will be displayed out in the hallway in a nice cabinet next to the Book of Mormon. It will just be one volume at a time, I'm telling her. We're not going to have seven different, uh, <laughs> seven different <laughs> cabinets. So with that, um, I just want to say again, thank you so much to the WIDSO Foundation and the partnership we have. And I want to introduce to you the person that um, is working with us at Chapman here. It has been such a pleasure to have Jacob Reniker this year, who's part-time on our staff and has been a wonderful addition, and is also the director of the John A. WIDSO Foundation. So I'm going to tell, I heard somebody say, ask you about your education. I want to tell you a few things. Um, a BA in Ancient Near Eastern Studies from BYU. And Jacob has an MA in Comparative Religion from the University of Washington and a PhD in Religion from Claremont Graduate University. And he helped us to put this together this evening. He will be teaching a course here at Chapman next fall. And um, we're just delighted um, for him to be working with us and teaching us and partnering with us. And so I want to invite you up. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks, Gail. Um, hi, I'm Jacob Reniker. Like Gail said, I'm the John A. Widso Fellow at the Fish Interfaith Center. Uh, so here on uh, staff part-time. Um, uh, this position is made possible by the John A. Widso Foundation. So part of what uh, I'm doing here on campus is uh, creating programming uh, about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, creating events, um, uh, and like I said, different programs, uh, different initiatives uh, that work with not just Latter-day Saint uh, students, uh, but also with the interfaith community. So the John A. Woodso Foundation uh, is, uh, is in the process of uh, creating a wide variety of programming with Chapman University and universities uh, around the world. Um, most notably uh, and most uh, geographically uh, close at USC. And so um, with the Woodsow Foundation's emphasis on promoting religious literacy uh, about the church uh, itself, um, one of the ways that we do that in promoting the you know, uh, teachings of the church, the uh, beliefs, practices, um, we're doing that in an interfaith context here at the Fish Interfaith Center uh, and elsewhere. And one of the things that we want to do is to put Latter-day Saint uh, thought, teachings, and practice in conversation with those uh, thoughts, uh, teachings, practices of other faith traditions uh, to help better educate other faith traditions uh, about the church, but also to be educated by them and to better understand uh, our uh, sisters and brothers of other faiths so that we can find those points where we can really work together, um, learn from one another and expand our understanding um, and, and outreach and the effect that we can have uh, in the world for good, for beauty and for truth. Um, so as part of that, uh, we're helping to, uh, sponsor, to sponsor with the, the Fish Interfaith Center the Excellence in Religious Education uh, Forum, and that's what we're uh, here for tonight. Um, and this year, uh, we've brought Julie Smith, who's just recently authored a uh, phenomenal volume of commentary on the Gospel of Mark. Um, and Julia will be the one to tell us all about this, uh, but I just wanted to say a few short words about her and her background uh, to get, so you can get to know her. Uh, Julie graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a BA in English and from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California uh, with an MA in Biblical Studies, hence her interest in, in the Bible. Um, she's on the executive board of the Mormon Theology Seminar uh, which is phenomenal. Uh, if you haven't been uh, able to look at the work that they've done, uh, it's, it's a really intensive environment uh, that a variety, people from a variety of different backgrounds get together and study uh, Latter-day Saint scripture uh, from a, a number of different perspectives. Uh, and and not just studying those from different perspectives, but putting those perspectives in conversation with one another. Uh, so the Mormon Theology uh, Seminar uh, currently uh, 
kind of centered out of the uh, Neil A. Maxwell Institute for uh, Religious Scholarship, uh, which is at BYU. Um, so you can uh, find out more about that uh, by visiting uh, maxwellinstitute.byu.edu uh, to see some of the work uh, that uh, Julius helped to, um, to uh, bring to fruition there and participate in herself. So in addition to being on the executive board for that Mormon theology seminar, uh, which is doing such important work, she's also on the steering committee for the BYU New Testament commentary series, of which her volume is a part. Um, uh, she's the author of Search, Ponder, and Pray, A Guide to the Gospels, which also, if you are not familiar with that, uh, uh, with that work, that is a phenomenal resource for individual study of the New Testament. And so with this year's uh, emphasis in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on the study of the New Testament, uh, this is really an incredible resource for uh, individuals and families to supplement and amplify your personal study with the Church's emphasis on you know, individual and family study of the Gospel. This book that she's uh, published previously, Search, Ponder, and Pray, is really indispensable for engaging with uh, the New Testament, for, for leading you into uh, questions, thoughts, and considering uh, different ways of approaching uh, the, the scriptures that you probably wouldn't have considered before um, that can en enrich your understanding and appreciation for uh, uh, the scriptures themselves, uh, the New Testament specifically. Um, she's also the editor and contributor uh, to a book called As Iron Sharp Sharpens Iron, Listening to the Various Voices of Scripture, uh, which is another very fascinating volume uh, where uh, different individuals from the scriptures, uh, so each chapter is authored by, uh, it has a different author, and you know, essentially the Authors of those texts, so say it's 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 Moses, uh, would could be put into conversation with uh, someone else uh, who writes a book of scripture. So say uh, you know, Joseph Smith uh, on something, and so it's kind of a fictional dialogue between two authors of scripture that talk about a particular kind of doctrinal topic, and so kind of a, a fictional kind of working through of what would it be like if these two were to have a conversation about this topic. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, kind of intellectual exercise that opens up some really interesting possibilities about how uh, we might think about different topics, teachings in the scriptures. Um, so if that's something that sounds interesting to you, I highly encourage you to, to take a look at that. Um, and Julie was the editor for that and made that volume possible. Um, she's also the uh, editor for Apocalypse, reading Revelation chapters 21 and 22, um, which is also from the Mormon Theology Seminar. Uh, she's married to Derek Smith. They live near Austin, Texas, where she homeschools uh, their children. She also blogs for the uh, uh, website Times and Seasons, where she is the book review editor. And beyond all that, uh, she's a genuinely good person and brilliant, and we're so lucky to have her here. So I turn the time over to Julie. Thank you, Jacob, for that very, very generous introduction. And I'd also like to thank the Fish Interface Center and the Witso Foundation for all the work that went into making this event possible tonight. So my youngest son is 14 and taller than I am. Uh, but I want to tell you a story about when he was two or three years old. So his normal practice was that when he would wake up, he would come wake me up. Uh, one day he decided not to wake me up and to go get his own breakfast. As you can probably already anticipate, the story ends with a mess in my kitchen. So about 20 or 30 minutes later, I wake up on my own and hear some noise. So I walk into the kitchen and where I'm standing, he has his back towards me and he's sitting at the table. So I was able to watch him unobserved for a few minutes. And this is what he was doing. He was pouring raisin bran on our kitchen table. He was eating the raisins. He was taking his fat little toddler arm and pushing all the flakes off the table onto the floor. He was pouring more raisin bran onto the table, picking out the raisins, repeating the process. I was just flabbergasted. I just It was so efficient in its mess making. I stood and watched it for a few minutes. And then finally I came to my senses and stopped him and we had a conversation about how this is not how you eat raisin bran. Um, we looked at the nutritional panel on the box. This is, you can't get the good stuff in here if you eat it this way. It's probably going to make your tummy hurt. And look at the floor, you're making a mess. 
So I realized later that this experience serves as an excellent parable for how too many of us approach our sacred scriptures, which is we go for the parts that are immediately appealing and easy. We look at what's left and we just get it out of the way. <laughs> And we shouldn't do that, right? It doesn't get us the nutritional benefits that the entire package would provide, and it makes a mess. And for a variety of historical reasons, the flakes that we tend to knock to the floor when we approach sacred texts are the stories about women, because historically most of the interpreters have been men and have come at it with their own unique concerns and needs, but perhaps not paid as much attention to the stories that are either about women or maybe more impactful for women. So I will do my small part tonight to highlight some stories about women in the Gospel of Mark with an eye to the fact that uh, several of the stories we will talk about tonight are actually found in the other Gospels as well, but Mark tends to handle them a bit differently. So I want to start out with Mark 5, and I had requested that our St. John's Bible be open to Mark 5, which is one of the illuminated pages, so please go take a look at that afterwards. And if you do that, you'll see that it's in three panels, and the reason it's in three panels is because this second half of Mark chapter 5 is an interrupted story. And this is a literary technique that Mark uses a lot, where one story begins, and in this case, it's the story that they come from Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue's home, to uh, let Jesus know that Jairus' daughter is at the point of death, and Jairus asks Jesus to come and, and heal her. As Jesus is on the way, the story gets interrupted, so we're at the second panel now. And this is by the woman with a hemorrhage of blood who comes to touch his hem, believing she will be healed. And not only is she healed, but Jesus invites her to sort of take center stage and describe what has happened to her, and then says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. When that middle story is over, we return back to the first story, and you'll see that illustrated in the third panel. By this point, Jairus' daughter has died, and so we have uh, what is in Mark, the only story of a raising from the dead here at the end of Mark 5. So when these stories are sandwiched in Mark, it's done for a very intentional purpose, which is to encourage the audience to compare and contrast the stories. And there's more there than meets the eye. That is, the stories are not just individual stories, but are meant to be interpreted in light of each other. And when we do this with these two women's stories, there is an awful lot to think about. So let's talk about some of the things they have in common. Both are focused on women, which is unusual enough, and also focused on their bodies. Um, also focused on concepts of life, death, and blood. The Hebrew Bible or Old Testament teaches that the life is in the blood, and so the fact that this woman has a hemorrhage of blood suggests that to an extent, at least metaphorically, she is losing her life. Oddly, the number 12 is associated with both stories. The woman with the hemorrhage of blood has been bleeding for 12 years. The girl is 12 years old. And that note that she's 12 years old is tacked on to the end of the story in a way that's sort of awkward, but highlights it. We see that it's not just sort of a simple stage direction or historical fact, but rather is important to the story. We know that in biblical times, numbers function symbolically. And if we think for a minute, well, what are there 12 of in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament? The obvious answer is the 12 tribes of Israel. Of course, by the first century, there are no longer 12 tribes, right? We have the 10 lost tribes. And so for them, the idea of 12 tribes suggests a restoration, and that's an idea that has a lot of resonance with a Latter-day Saint reader to think about the promise of restoration uh, to the 12 tribes in these stories. Both stories mention fear. The woman is fearful to tell Jesus what she has done, Jesus tells Jairus not to fear. Both stories have violations of social expectations. We would not expect the ruler of the synagogue to come beseech Jesus, who appears as someone of lower status. It is, of course, socially inappropriate and likely to transmit impurity that the bleeding woman touches Jesus. And we have issues of ritual purity in both stories related to the woman's hemorrhage of blood and to the daughter uh, who is a corpse. 
There's also touch in both stories. And then one that I find particularly interesting is that we have the motif of someone falling at Jesus's feet in both stories because both Jairus and the bleeding woman are described that way. Both stories refer to daughter, and I, I find this one particularly interesting because in the story of the woman with the hemorrhage of blood, she's initially introduced in an anonymous way. We don't get a name, we don't get a geographic location, we don't know who she's related to, we don't know anything about her. Uh, in terms of identity, we just know about her condition. But by the end of that story, Jesus is referring to her as his daughter. And so there's this very compelling contrast and comparison with the girl who is the daughter of the synagogue, as the daughter of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, and the girl, the woman, who is Jesus's daughter. And they act a bit differently in that the daughter of the synagogue is passive in her story. She still receives Jesus' intercession, but at, at the behest of her father. Whereas Jesus' daughter is active and seeks that out herself. So these similarities are very significant, and I think we can learn a lot from pondering them. But there are also really substantive differences between the stories that I think are revelatory as well. With Jairus, we have someone who thinks a grand sort of public gesture is appropriate. Follow me to my house, raise my daughter, uh, inter intercede for her. On the other hand, with the woman with a hemorrhage of blood, uh, she's not a big gesture sort of a person. She just tries to sort of very quietly and subtly without drawing attention to herself, touch Jesus's hem. Well, you know what? They were both right. They were both able to access Jesus' power, one through the grand gesture, one through the small gesture. But Jesus also turns the tables on both stories. The raising of the girl from the dead is done very privately. It's one of the few times in Mark that we know that the crowd or a larger group is not welcome because only the closest circle of disciples and the girl's parents are invited. And whereas the bleeding woman, as far as we can tell from the story, would have been content to not actually even speak to Jesus, but just to touch his hem and then have the story be over, Jesus invites her to come to the center and speak to the whole group that is, is there surrounding Jesus and say what has happened. So uh, they start with different goals of this is going to be sort of a big production, this is going to be a very quiet action, and Jesus reverses it in both stories. So I think that's very powerful. Now, we have Jesus and this bleeding woman or hemorrhaging woman both being supplicants to Jesus, but if you try to, to pick two people at opposite ends of the social hierarchy in the first century, you couldn't do a much better job than these two. Uh, we presume Jairus is a leader in the synagogue, as a man of some wealth and status. He's also male. He feels comfortable approaching Jesus and say, please do this thing for me. Whereas on the other hand, we have this woman who apparently was wealthy at one point but has spent all her money on doctors. We don't have any indication whatsoever that she has any sort of connection to power. No one is there to intercede for her. We don't learn about any of her relations. And again, we see Jesus' power is sufficient for both of them despite their radically different social locations. And so I think that's quite powerful. There's another layer here too, and that is something that I find quite characteristic of Mark, which is that Mark frequently begins to pattern a story after an Old Testament or a Hebrew Bible text. And so I can sort of imagine the early audiences of Mark sort of nodding along with this idea of, oh yeah, I've heard this story before. This is a riff on whatever story it is from the Old Testament. But then what Mark does is introduce this tweak in the middle of the story so that the scene shifts. And all of a sudden, the audience is thinking, well, that's not how that story plays out in my Old Testament. Of course, they wouldn't have called it the Old Testament then. We call it that today, um, or the Hebrew Bible. But at any rate, this shift or surprise or tweak is introduced to the story. And that would have really gotten the audience's attention because it departs from the pattern that they've seen before. So what's the pattern here? Well, I think there's some really profound parallels between the woman with the hemorrhage of blood and the story of the fall as related in Genesis 3. When we look at the ancient Greek translation of Genesis 3, it has about a dozen terms in common with our story here. And then if we expand our scope a little bit to look not just at the same wording, but the same themes, we get several more resonances between the two. And these thematic associations are very powerful. So in both cases, 
we have the internal thought processes of a woman making a decision. To put it mildly, this is not typical fair for sacred writ, right? But we see that for Eve in the story of the fall, and we see that for the bleeding woman here. In both cases, the woman is taking the initiative to act in a difficult situation. Both stories have a transgressive touch as Eve touches the fruit that she is not supposed to touch, and the woman is not supposed to touch Jesus because she is unclean. So in the garden story, as it is related in the Genesis text, Adam is presented as passive. This may explain why Jesus comes across as so passive in the story of the hemorrhaging woman. It has often surprised commentators or even just readers of this text when they realize that Jesus' power goes out of him without any apparent willful action on his part. He recognizes that it has happened, but apparently does not cause it to happen, at least as Mark relates the story. And so this is the point where our ancient audiences who recognize these parallels to the Genesis text may be thinking, aha, I see what is happening here. Jesus is in the role of Adam, who is passive in this story. However, in the middle of the story, Jesus shifts roles. When he asks, who has touched me? And when he pronounces a blessing, in contrast to the garden story where a curse is pronounced, it becomes clear that he's no longer fulfilling the role of Adam, but rather fulfilling the role of God, because it's in the garden that God asks the questions and pronounces the curses. And this is, again, a very typical pattern in Mark where we start out with Jesus filling one role from an, a biblical story and end with Jesus actually filling the role of God in that story. Um, and it's something we see throughout Mark that I think would have been very powerful to ancient audiences. In both the stories, we have women, after their transgressive touch, hiding from the divine presence until they are summoned by a question. They both get questioned about their behavior. Interestingly enough, though, in the story of the fall, there's a little bit of buck passing, right, in response to that question. However, with the bleeding woman's story, she tells the whole truth, and the language used in Mark is very direct about this, that she tells the whole truth. So there's a little bit of a difference there. She's claiming responsibility for her own action. And then we get a different conclusion, where the story of the fall ends with curses, Mark's story ends with blessings, namely to go in peace. So there's a little bit of redemption or setting to rights the story of the fall that happens through the parallels in this story with a really strong focus on the consequences of a woman's action. And so by showcasing a woman, one with a uniquely female problem, the story overall emphasizes the ability that Jesus has to overcome the effects of the fall and how that extends to all people. And the bleeding woman it takes on Eve's role, and these effects of the fall are overcome through her interaction with Jesus in the story. There's also some interesting parallels between the bleeding woman and Jesus that we find in Mark's story, because there's a lot of similar vocabulary in Mark that is only used to describe the suffering of the woman with the hemorrhage and used to describe Jesus's suffering, particularly the word suffer, which is used nowhere else in Mark except to describe both the bleeding woman and Jesus. We have blood pouring out from both of them, um, and it will not come as a shock to you when I say that associating Jesus' blood with menstrual blood would have not been perceived as positive, but rather as embarrassing in the first century. But that leads us into one of Mark's main themes for Jesus' suffering and crucifixion, is that it is an embarrassment. And so it fits really well thematically in Mark. And both women, the woman, and Jesus know in this story that something has happened in their bodies. We have the same verb used when the woman knows that she's been healed and Jesus knows that virtue or power has gone out of him. So there's this very strong parallel created between both of their bodies. And I find this very powerful because even 20 centuries later, we still live in a culture that is often embarrassed by, shocked by, disappointed in women's bodies. This would have been perhaps only more true in the first century. So to see this woman's suffering as a type of Christ's suffering is, I think, very, very powerful. 
and to see the ideas that Mark will later develop about Jesus' suffering prefigured in a female body would, I believe, have been very powerful for these early audiences. And this is a good moment to notice that uh, generally the accepted date for the writing of Mark's gospel is about, 67, or sorry, about 70 AD, so 67, 68 which means that we have almost a full generation where the stories are transmitted orally before they are written down in Mark. And what this means is that for a generation, these stories were meaningful enough that someone wanted to tell them and someone else wanted to hear them. And that process happens as far as we can tell over and over again. And I find it fascinating to speculate about who would have been telling a story like this. My best guess is that it was not 15-year-old boys. My best guess is that it was women for whom this story of irregular menstrual bleeding and Jesus' reaction to it would have profoundly resonated with their own experiences and honored their experiences. There are also interesting similarities between Jesus' experience and that of Jairus' daughter. As I mentioned before, this is the only instance of a raising from the dead as a miracle in Mark before Jesus' own. We have the same Greek word used for rise to describe the girl and to describe Jesus' rising. In both the story of Jesus' death and resurrection and in the raising of Jairus' daughter, Jesus is mocked using very similar language. And the Greek word for astonishment is used only in response to the raising of the girl and to the reaction of Jesus' raising. So for our early audiences in the first century who are hearing the gospel read out loud to them, these verbal echoes would have been a lot more noticeable and trenchant for them than they are for us. And so they would have heard in this story of the raising of Jairus' daughter a prefiguring or an anticipation of the raising of Jesus from the dead, which again would have been very powerful, I think, to a lot of early audiences and to us as well to think about Jesus' resurrection anticipated by that of a young girl. And again, we don't live in a culture that often honors women's bodies or those of teenage girls. And so to allow that body to prefigure, to stand in, to anticipate Jesus' resurrection is a very, very powerful message. I will next shift to talking very, very briefly about an incident in Mark 7. And so what we have here is we have Jesus trying to get some alone time, but his efforts are stymied by a Gentile woman who seeks Jesus out, enters into a home where he is staying, to ask that her daughter be released from a demon. And Jesus' initial response is negative. He says it's not right for the dogs to eat the children's bread. Uh, dogs is an ethnic slur for Gentiles, and that is how that word likely would have been interpreted by a first century audience. So that is perhaps shocking to us to think of Jesus using what many would have heard as, in effect, an ethnic slur against Gentiles. The woman, though, responds positively. She is a model of many things in this story, and one of them is graciousness and civility, when she says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the crumbs. And Jesus says, for this saying, the demon is out of your daughter. So this is an interesting story because it may be inaccurate to describe Jesus as having performed this exorcism. What he actually says is because of what the woman has said, the demon has left the daughter. So did the woman's words perform the exorcism, perhaps? Now, the traditional interpretation of this story is that Jesus is testing her faith. And this may well be the case, but I will raise an objection to it. And I will raise that objection as the mother of sons that are 21, 17, and 14. And I will say this, please do not tell my boys that sometimes when the answer is no, you should ask again because your faith is being tested, okay? Please don't tell them that. We would need to wonder, if we wanted to support that theory, why Jesus doesn't test anyone else who approaches him for a miracle. Uh, we would need to explain why we shouldn't take no for an answer from Jesus, which we know in the LDS tradition can uh, get you so into some troubles if you're responsible for a manuscript. And we would also need to wonder why Jesus is testing her faith, 
Uh, she seems to be aware of it. If he's not aware of it, then we're in a position of arguing that he's not omniscient. I feel like one of the reasons people advocate for this interpretation is they want to preserve Jesus's omniscience, but I think that reading undermines it to an extent. So I think while this may be controversial to some interpreters, it is better to interpret the story as Jesus changing his mind. Some of you will not be comfortable with that at all. A friend pointed out to me that for Jesus to be our model in all things, he would need to model for us how one goes about incorporating new information. That's kind of a difficult trick for an omniscient, omnipotent person to pull off. But just as in most traditions, Jesus' baptism is not understood as strictly necessary in the sense that he did not have sins that needed to be remitted, but rather something he does to show a model for what all the faithful followers need to do. We might understand this story as Jesus modeling what it looks like to be raised in an environment where ethnic slurs exist, to use them because they are part of your culture, and then to have someone show you. And the showing here is part of what I think is so interesting is the way she adopts his metaphor. Is in the Jewish tradition, dogs are regarded as unclean. So when Jesus talks about the bread being cast to the dogs, the image there is not the puppy under the table that we know and love and post videos of Instagram to. The image is of this unclean thing outside of the house and I'm in effect taking bread out of the mouths of my children and pitching it out the window to these unclean scavengers. Well, of course, no one wants to do that. That would be a ridiculous thing to do. The woman, from her Gentile perspective, does have a view of cute little puppies under the table. And she says, well, the dogs can eat the crumbs. And part of the image of the dogs eating the crumbs is that you're not taking the bread away from the children. If you've ever fed a child, you know that there are plenty of leftovers for the dog to eat under the table without interfering with what the child will consume. And so she shows this incredible humility of positioning herself as a dog under the table so she is not grandiose in this scenario. But she's adopting a different cultural frame of reference where dogs are not outside the house, but rather pets under the table. She's acknowledging the priority of Jesus's ministry to the Jews by saying the children will eat first and the children eating first does not need to interfere with the dogs eating under the table. And so I, what I see Jesus doing in this story is being presented as a model of how we overcome the cultural blinders that everyone born into mortality is raised with and the assumptions we make about what is culturally appropriate and particularly other people. We see him modeling how to change his mind, how to learn, and how to respond. And so I actually find this interpretation to be incredibly faith-affirming and not to mention very relevant to many of the challenges we face in the early 21st century. I will wrap up with talking about my favorite story in the book of Mark, which is in Mark chapter 14, where the woman comes to anoint Jesus. I think we often overlook the significance of this story. And part of the reason we do so may be because the fact that a woman is present. And I know most of us are thinking, well, we would, ne we would never do that. We know better than that. I have read biblical commentaries written as late as the 1990s that have suggested that this can't be an important story because a woman is present, which obviously it is not an idea I agree with. But to give a sense of why this is important is we know Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah. Messiah is the Hebrew word that means anointed. Christ is the Greek word that means anointed. This is the story of the anointing. So what's happening here? Anointing has many references in the biblical world, but two of the most prominent are first as a burial anointing. To the extent that Jeremiah uses some imagery of death of the broken little containers, which often after the corpse was anointed, these broken containers would have been thrown in to the grave site with the corpse since their mission had been accomplished. So they become a symbol for death. And so uh, the anointing is part of their burial ritual. And Jesus uses this language in Mark 14. He explains that she has come to anoint his body to the burying. 
even though he is not dead yet. And this is such a powerful moment because even later in the narrative, his, some of his other disciples will struggle with the idea that Jesus will suffer and die. But here is a woman who understands already and is acting appropriately in light of the fact that his death is imminent. So she's taking on a prophetic understanding in this story. But that's not the only meaning of anointing. It's also part of their coronation ceremony. And we see this very clearly in, for example, 1 Samuel with the, uh, with the kingly anointing. So we have a royal anointing. This is the coronation ceremony. And so she understands his kingly nature as well. And I don't see this as a situation where we need to pick one meaning or the other. I see it as a meshing or a coming together. And I think that's her contribution here. The reason the story is so important is we have some people who can see then and now the need for Jesus to suffer and die in the humility portion of his ministry. We see some people who understand the royal glorification aspect, but people tend to have a hard time putting those together. But she has unified them, not by, I just lost my ring, um, not by giving him a title, not by using one word, but by enacting what it means to say that he is the Christ or the Messiah. So this is a profound truth that she is teaching. And I think another reason that we perhaps have not paid as much attention to this story as we should have is because she is silent throughout the story. And normally, if we want to understand Jesus' role better, we look to titles. We try to understand what does it mean to say he's the Lamb of God? What does it mean to say he's the Redeemer? What does it mean to say he's the son of God or the savior? This story doesn't actually present us with a title. She does not say a single word. It instead presents us with an enactment of what it means for him to hold that title because he won't be a king like anyone else. Israel had some pretty crummy kings, as you may well be aware. And it's not just that he's dying as a martyr. Many people have died as a martyr. It's the fact that he unites those two aspects, both the burial, the suffering aspect, and the royal kingly aspect that make his mission and ministry unique. So it's very powerful. And I think it's well worth noting that Jesus says, wheresoever this gospel is preached, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Now, interestingly enough, in Mark, there actually isn't a command to memorialize the Last Supper that comes from other Gospels. In Mark, the memorial command is for the anointing. The thing people are supposed to remember from Mark's Gospel is this anointing story. And we tend not to do that very often, which I find quite surprising. I will add for the benefit of Latter-day Saints and the audience that the Joseph Smith translation to the anointing adds some really interesting material that creates a chiastic structure and emphasizes uh, not just as in Mark's gospel that wherever the gospel is preached but also whenever. So it amplifies it in both space and time. I will also very briefly mention and. I'll tell you a story about this. As my mother is not at all religious. I'm a convert to the LDS church. And my mother was in my home and saw this painting I have of the Last Supper that has women and children present, which I think we can be fairly certain uh, that they are there. But my mother's response, in, you know, she's familiar, obviously, with Western art, where you almost never see women and children present at the Last Supper. So we were kind of talking about it. And her response was sort of a, scoff with like, well, of course, who was going to do the cooking? Um, but the evidence for women at the Last Supper is actually quite a bit better than that. So first of all, it was typical for women to participate, for the whole family to participate in a Passover meal. Jesus's tendency relative to his tradition is always to be more inclusive. If this were the one and only time where he was being far more exclusive by making it a male-only event, I suspect we would have heard about it. Now, that's an argument from silence. Those are always a little bit dangerous. But the evidence is, I think, a little stronger than the Western art tradition might lead you to believe. Remember at the Last Supper, Jesus says that it's one of the 12 who will betray him. That line doesn't make any sense if only the 12 are present. So that's a hint that there are others than how we tend to usually envision or depict it. But the strongest evidence 
comes from the fact that when the women are in the tomb, the young man says, he's going before you to Galilee as he told you. And the only time in Mark Jesus says he will go to Galilee is at the Last Supper. So you either have to posit that there's this other incident unrecorded in Mark where Jesus told the women he would go before them to Galilee. And that's what the young man is referring to, even though in the audience, as the audience, we would be totally in the dark about that. The much simpler explanation is that the young man in the tomb is referring to the instance at the Last Supper, affirming that the women in the tomb were present at the Last Supper, and that that's when they heard Jesus say that. So I feel like that's fairly solid evidence. So I think we can, um, from this very, very brief survey, see that we have been picking historically the raisins out of the raisin bran, doing what's typical and easy and has made the most sense to the historically overwhelmingly male interpreters who have done the bulk of public interpretation of these stories. And we've overlooked the full picture. And so one of the things that I hoped to do with a commentary on Mark is to shine the light a little more on some of these neglected stories about women. And so I'm grateful to have a chance to share some of that with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I, I get to ask the first question and sit here, and then uh, you can ask some questions. Uh, but first, I want to say thank you. Um, really remarkable. And one of the things I would encourage is, um, or that I found really helpful in this, is when you, at the very beginning, uh, when you say, I'm not going to use these sorts of criticism and outlines a number of different types of criticism that people often do when they deal with. Um, especially the uh, Gospels and the Bible, and then um, outline the types that you are. And I just think that much is something that you never see in one place. So what is historical criticism? What is literary criticism? I mean, it's actually really, really helpful. So read that first part, and you'll suddenly know what scholars have been doing all this time. And you can almost tell which one they're using by the kinds of things they say, too. So it's really great. And um, so anyway, that was really helpful. But I wanted to... I wanted to follow up on something you were just talking about, um, and that two, a couple of things came to mind. But one is um, there seems to be, and this is something that I've thought about Mark, and I'm nowhere the scholar that you are. That there is often emphasis, and you use um, you use a term you talk about, kind of the way, um, which is the way that is being shown that often in Mark, um, words are not that important. And even, for example, when um, um, Bartimaeus is healed, um, which is a second of important uh, uh, blind um, healing stories, that um, he doesn't, it's, it's not so much what he says, right, as what he, what he um, sort of does that's important. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. What do you see in Mark in terms of, I think we often say you have to be able to declare who Jesus is in order to be a follower. And Mark seems to be saying following is something else. At least I've seen that. So I wondered if you could talk about that. I think that's absolutely true. And it's actually really surprising how little Jesus says in Mark. Mm -hmm. um, he teaches mostly through the performance of miracles. And he obviously talks when people approach him. But there's no Sermon on the Mount in Mark. There's no farewell discourse. Um, you do have chapters 4 and chapters 13. But there's the exception that proves the rule that Jesus is not talking to teach about the way he's acting mm -hmm. and responding to his environment to teach about the way. And I think the best way to get a handle on this is in Mark 8, we have Peter saying, you are the Christ, and then immediately misunderstanding what that word means. And so you have this example where Peter can say exactly the right word. Jesus absolutely is the Christ. But in the next breath, he's arguing with Jesus about whether Jesus should suffer and die mm -hmm. and showing that he thinks he has sort of a different vision for Jesus's ministry than Jesus has. And Peter's vision should predominate. And Jesus obviously shuts that down really quickly. But 
it makes it, um, in Mark, we don't so much want to focus on this statement, you are the Christ, as this larger context that Peter can use that word without understanding half of what it means. And then by contrast, the anointing woman uses exactly zero words, but perfectly illustrates what it means to be the Christ by this action that shows both the burial, which is the part Peter has a hard time with, the suffering and dying part, and then also the glorification. Uh, so there is almost a hostility to language in Mark in preference to actions that I think really does come through. The generally recognized major theme of Mark is discipleship, and it is not a preachy discipleship. It is an active discipleship. And almost a, almost an emphasis on, um, from what I, what I see in here too, is um, that most, at least the disciples, are blind to that. They want to use the right words, right? But they really right. never get it, and in fact, oh. in the end, they run away, right? So right. they still never get it, right? Yeah. Whereas the women stay at the end, so they, but but you don't hear them say anything. It's just the act of being there. That's yeah. It's quite profound. Yeah. 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 When I think we often put so much emphasis on words, you know, saying this is what I believe, and um, doesn't seem to be what Mark is saying. Yeah. Um, I had one other, one other, um, well, maybe we should open it up. I have one other thought about, but does anybody else have a question at this point that you want to ask? And we can, um, yeah. There's a microphone, Mohammed will bring it to you. Thanks, Mohammed. Some time ago, I did study the book of Mark and the, one thing, a little different twist on the, when you're talking about Jesus referring to the Gentiles as being dogs. It's my understanding there's two words for dogs in Greek. One is a street dog, devourer, a thief, a killer, and to be feared. And the other word is a household pet, a protector, works the sheep, and a, and a beloved member of the family. And it was Jesus himself, at least according to Mark, he used the term that they don't, you don't feed the dogs, your pet that you love dearly, not just not demeaning or cursing the, the Gentiles as unworthy. It says you don't, you don't give food to the dogs. It was like unheard of. And then she demonstrates her faith, saying, "But they do eat, as you mentioned." And the Lord blesses her because He recognizes, and she says, calls him Lord again, and He recognizes her as a Gentile that has an absolute right to be blessed, and she's approaching God and sees Jesus as God. And because God answers all prayers, he says, I bless you, not that you are because you're a Gentile, but I bless you as a righteous, beloved woman and mother. And you come with me with a righteous prayer. It's kind of a, it's that, that little word there can have such a huge difference. Am I wrong about that? The word, the Greek word for dog, that's been my understanding for some time. Um, I think probably a more trenchant way to approach it would be when the woman is introduced, she gets three markers of her ethnicity as a Gentile. And so because of that, I would be hesitant to underplay the fact that from the get-go, the story is strongly, strongly emphasizing that she is a Gentile. And then another part of the larger context, which I didn't mention, is that in Mark, we have two feeding miracles. And one based, they're very, very similar in chapter six and chapter eight, except one is very, very much for the Jews. The language is just thoroughly, thoroughly Jewish down to the word for basket, which was recognized as sort of a Jewish basket. And then in the second feeding miracle, there's all this, this language about Gentiles. Well, one is in chapter six and one is in chapter eight, which means that this woman's story is in the middle. And in the Jewish feeding miracle, as you know, there are baskets of leftovers. And so I think that leftover bread is, is something the audience is very much aware of behind this discussion of crumbs. And then when this woman promotes this idea that his ministry can extend to everyone because there's enough leftovers after the children have eaten, then we have a healing miracle or a feeding miracle for the Gentiles in chapter eight. And so I see the theme of, of Gentiles as being very, very powerful throughout what's happening in this whole section of Mark in terms of understanding um, what the real impact of the story is. So that's the, the angle that I would emphasize. Another question, Jeff? 
you've talked about how the women are many times silent, although their actions speak louder than words. But in this case, the Gentile woman is quite articulate very quickly. She responds incredibly witty almost uh, to his response. How would you explain that in context for what we're seeing in the book yeah, of Mark? Yeah, that is an exception to the general trend of, of wordiness or attitude toward words in Mark. And some people read this story as sort of a play on um, uh, Greek philosophical debate and banter with her perhaps fitting into that tradition. Um, and the idea of cynical philosophy, not with the modern connotation, with the ancient connotation of cynics, a word very similar uh, to the words language used in this story. So there does seem to be a little bit of, of word play and debate. And I, what I see that feeding into is, again, this model of Jesus as someone who's willing to model for us how to respond to new ideas. So it, it does put her in a unique role in Mark. In the uh, last chapter of Mark, there's a number of unique references to women uh, compared to the way that uh, the resurrection is discussed in other uh, Gospels. In particular, uh, Mark refers to uh, three women, uh, Mary Magdalene and uh, Mary, the mother of James, and uh, Salome. And uh, I wonder, for example, Mary, the mother of James, of course, the brother of the Lord is named James. There's another James. And, you know, who are we talking? Is this another way of referring to Mary, the mother of Jesus, maybe in a different or polite sense? And then a little later uh, in the chapter, we also read the reference to Mary Magdalene specifically as the one out of whom Jesus cast seven devils. Um, I don't know if you have some thoughts as to this, maybe the significance of these references and the way Mark portrays that. Sure. So the reference to Mary Magdalene is interesting because that's probably not part of the original text of Mark. Um, there's a very strong case to be made for the Gospel of Mark ending in chapter 16, verse 8, which is before we get to the Mary Magdalene reference. So if we just want to focus in on the original text, then we would bracket that. As far as the other women, um, boy, it is tricky. As best we can tell, something like 40% of Jewish women in the first century were named Mary. <laughs> so... I just throw my hands up at that. We are never going to figure out, you know, when you, and especially when you compare across Gospels, which Mary we're talking about. I think that one, we will probably have to await further light and knowledge to figure out the who's who on that one. I just don't feel like that's accessible based on what we know now, knowing that the name is so common. So it's very hard to sort out. Fortunately, I don't think Mark's point is the individual identity of the women, but it's women themselves as witnesses. Um, as you may be aware in the first century, it's very much debated whether women can be legal witnesses in a courtroom setting, whether their testimony is reliable. So my, my field is not apologetics, but I do have to say no one would have made up a story of women as resurrection witnesses. Um, it's like in our cultural context today, we would not allow a three-year-old to testify in court because they might start talking about the dragon they saw yesterday or something. We don't consider three-year-olds reliable witnesses. Many, many people in the first century do not consider women reliable witnesses, so you would not make up a story with women as witnesses. So I think that we can be safe even um, if we wanted to be very, very critical and interrogate these texts, that this is not a later addition to the story. And so then I think it raises some really interesting questions about why women are chosen. And if I can talk about Luke for a minute, when the women report back, they hear from the male disciples, Luke records that they, it seemed to them as idle tales. And it's fascinating to me that you literally cannot be a Christian if you are not willing to take what women say seriously not just in the 21st century, but in a cultural context where whether women should be allowed to testify in legal situations is very much an open question for debate. So culturally, that's very, very radical. You literally cannot believe Jesus was resurrected unless you're willing to believe that you can trust women's voices. So I, I find that interesting and very significant. Amy, Amy Jill Levine was here a couple of years ago, and um, and she's amazing, uh, biblical scholar, but she talked about that, you know, about how everyone is named Mary, and and then talked about how we think this is all the same person, you know, and so the no idea. so that you know the prostitute and the one with the devils and 
and the one that was with Jesus. And she said, they were all Mary. You know, they were, <laughs> so it was all the, and actually there's no evidence that they're the same person at all, especially when you look at it that way. But um, fascinating. It was really fun to hear her, um, her discourse on that. She's really fun. Um, I was, I was going to ask one other thing, and I was thinking about this notion of, um, that really it's the physical presence in some ways. It's so much about body. I was thinking, Damon, about your comment about the body and the soul and um, how important that is. And in Mark, it's really about the body and often of women that is really the testimony. They were the ones there. They were the ones that, that watched, the ones that anointed. And the words are not nearly as important. And I think so often how far we've come from that. I mean, it's a little bit what I was saying before in terms of, you know, is it the actions that matter? Is it the staying power? Is it the demonstrating who he is and was, but not through our words? Yeah. Um, and and the, um, the um, verse or the, the experience of the woman touching Jesus, feeling the power going out of him, and the pr crowds are pressing all around him. Um, I've worked with students with that image a lot because how did he know? I mean, that's one of the most fascinating stories. It says there were crowds pressing, right? And even the disciples said, how did you know? I mean, they were like, what, what do you mean a woman touched you? There's a million, you know, most of us would be like trying to get out of the crowd because it was so crazy. And, and one of the things that is often demonstrated to me is the character of Jesus, you know, the ability to be, um, we, talk, we were talking about mindfulness earlier, but kind of the ability to be so mindful and so present and so absolutely um, um, able to sense the needs of people, which again is not something we often do because we're so busy talking, right, <laughs> that we're not aware, we're not just able to sense that um, and the, and the, the then the bravery of the woman to sort of make her way through um, what that must have meant for her when there were people everywhere and pressing. So even more so that she was, um, she didn't say a lot, but she was certainly brave in terms of moving through. Yeah, I think that's true. One thing we didn't get a chance to talk about tonight was there are parts of Mark that are really funny. And I think for something to succeed as an oral performance, especially something with as heavy elements as Mark has in telling the story of Jesus's life and death, you need some funny moments. And I feel like there's a really good chance that for many storytellers, this moment where Jesus says, who touched me, is one where the audience laughs. Yeah. It's like, what do you mean who touched you? About 40 people at once. I mean, that's, yeah. and, and then to realize that it's not just funny, it's a little bit of release to see it funny, especially because we have this tension where the daughter of, of Jairus is ill at that moment, so we need a little bit of release there. Um, but I, I think that's one of the moments that might have gotten a laugh in Mark's gospel. Yes. That's great. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Mark were apostles, they were disciples, they never knew Christ during his life, they never witnessed his miracles. Maybe Mark as a small child might have traveled with his mother, but Mark was the, didn't he, he's translated for Peter who couldn't write or read Greek, and I think that's what he did, and Luke was a physician to Paul. Where do we think that Mark, is it Mary? Did he get most of his information from Mary and Peter? Do, what is, what's the general feeling so, of where Mark um, gets his detailed, yeah. detailed, detailed, like he's standing there watching it, information? Right. Um, a, a lot of the data points that you just went through are what has been traditional in scholarship for most of the 20th century that has gotten a little bit of a new look, uh, a little reassessment in the last couple of decades because the evidence for those kinds of things like um, Mark being Peter's interpreter is perhaps not as strong as we have been led to believe. And so the position I take in the commentary, and, and I try to I do it in appendix, I try to weigh the evidence. The main message I try to get across is our level of surety is very low. The evidence is just quite scant. Um, if I had to suggest what I think the process was for the creation of Mark, this is about where I would land, is for a couple of decades at least, these stories are told orally by more than one person. They are then written down, but this is not like we think of writing today. And an analogy I like to use is if you think of a Shakespearean play, Shakespeare doesn't write those plays with the script as the point. The point is the performance. 
And similarly with Mark, the writing down was not the point. The point was the performance. There's very low literacy rates. The physical texts are very expensive. Most people are encountering this as something they hear. And there's more than one storyteller. And it is likely that the person who wrote it down was named Mark. Any, and the reason I say that is just because there aren't other names attributed to it. And when there's a lack of certainty, you end up with more than one name attributed to it. So, so yes, he was probably named Mark. As for any association with Peter, I think the evidence is a lot weaker there than we are often led to believe. Um, I, I think it's probably unlikely that there was an association with Peter. We don't know what the transmission process is with the stories in terms of who told what story to whom. We do get some glimpses, for Luke at least, where it talks about Mary pondering these things in her heart, that perhaps Mary is a source for some of that material, but that's not in Mark. So what I see happening is that the stories are told again and again by anonymous storytellers, and then eventually something is written down, but really the writing down is not the point. So that's how I would describe uh, how we end up with this text. Then, with that commentary, Julie, how do you can how do you can how do you des describe why Matthew and Mark have so many similar elements as you read them, as far as the the actual details? Yeah. You know, I know there's large differences, but there's a lot that's similar. Right, there is. Um, I think it's safe to say that when Matthew and Luke write, they have a copy of Mark in hand. And I say that because if you look very closely at the kind of changes, they seem like you would have to have a written copy in hand to make those changes. Matthew and Luke obviously have other sources, could be oral sources, could be written sources. They have some material they share that's not in Mark. And so there are other sources, um, but it seems quite clear, and again, we can never be 100% certain about these things, and the evidence is a lot scantier, more scant, I don't know the proper way to say that. Um, not as solid as we would often like to believe, either coming out of faith traditions where it's said very strongly, this person has written this book, the evidence is often not quite there, and even sometimes in scholarly circles where um, for about a decade of my younger life, I would read every commentary, say, Mark is written in 67, 68, okay, fine. And then when I finally started digging into that question in my work on this commentary, I was like, huh, the evidence for that is really not so great, you guys. Um, and that is something I address in the book. That the, and so the larger point that I'm trying to make here is that we often reach conclusions based on fairly scanty evidence, whether it's something traditional coming out of a faith tradition or it's something coming out of scholarship, because there's just not as much evidence as we would like for the backstory to the story. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. It was excellent. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm not really familiar with the whole story of the anointing, and I feel like I've missed I've missed something really significant in the old or in the New Testament based upon what you're saying. A couple of just quick questions: Is it is it in the other Gospels as well? And maybe can you just talk a little bit more about it to help me understand yeah. why that was so significant? So interestingly enough, the story of Jesus being anointed by a woman, and just that sort of bare bones, Jesus anointed by a woman is one of the exceptionally few stories that is in all four Gospels. When you sit down with them, you will become very frustrated. And I say that particularly, and, and just to outline it, um, Mark and Matthew are telling virtually verbatim stories, although it functions a little differently in Mark's text because of placement and themes and a few other things, um, but virtually verbatim. But if you sit down with Mark and Luke, it is so frustrating because you can look at it and say, these stories have so much in common, this has got to be the same historical incident. And then you look at the differences and you say, these stories are so different, this can't be the same historical incident. And I just feel like if I look at the list of similarities, I'm like, yeah, this is the same story, they just recorded it in different directions. If I look at the list of differences, I'm like, no way is this the same story. And then John is telling a different story with some different details. Um, as, as we mentioned earlier, in the introduction, I try to outline the approach that I take in the commentary. And these kinds of questions that we're asking about, okay, what actually happened historically, that's really not a question I take up in the book. And the reason I don't um, 
is because I spend enough of my life trying to adjudicate mutually exclusive historical interpretations from a gaggle of boys, namely my sons telling different stories about what happened, that I don't want to do that in, in my scholarly work. And I do have that sense of like you sit down and the stories are similar enough, but they're not, and there's these gaps and you can't fill them in and you can't quite figure out what happened. And I also just feel like from a devotional perspective, it's just not terribly interesting to me. The kind of questions that I am interested in and the overriding question in the commentary is, what would this story have meant to Mark's original audience? Mark's original audience does not have Matthew or Luke or John because they do not exist yet. And so I tried to be really, really narrow and focus on that question. And so I don't really look, I'm, fa I'm fascinated by them to an extent. They are, they're definitely puzzles of these historical questions, but to focus on really a literary question of what does this story mean to the audience. And the audience is not saying, huh, Luke tells this story really differently because Luke is not written yet. So it's not something I address in the book. Actually, one of the wonderful things about Mark, too, if, if, of course, as you said, the evidence is scanty, but it seems to be the first one that was written down and, um, and from all the evidence. And, and it's, that's one of the reasons that I, I think it's my favorite gospel. It's, it's simple in some ways, but also um, you, can, you don't have to think about that in a sense. You can sort of say, what was Mark trying to say and why did he say it this way? And uh, I just really appreciate that. Yeah, Jeff. Um, moving outside of Mark uh, to John, of course, uh, I've always been fascinated by the fact that the uh, uh, Samaritan woman at the well, um, she's really the first person that Christ announces that he's the Messiah to uh, in a public sense. And of course, here you've got, again, a woman deemed to be unclean, Samaritan, she's an adulterer and so forth. And yet, to, this is the woman to whom he gives the announcement. Likewise, at the end of his ministry, uh, he, the, the woman who is Mary Magdalene to whom he's going to announce his resurrection. Thoughts on, again, maybe two of the most significant announcements in the entirety of his ministry, both picking uh, specific women to do that to. Yeah, and it's interesting to me that even though the Gospels are telling really quite different stories, they all emphasize women, but do it in different ways. So that we start Matthew's Gospel off with a genealogy that we would not expect to include women, and not only includes women, it includes women with really unusual stories. Um, and that's where Matthew is starting the story, so that's fascinating. We've talked a lot about women in Mark. You mentioned some really prominent stories in John. Um, and I think it is another example of how women's stories are neglected because a standard Christian trope is the disciples leaving their nets to follow Jesus. Well, who left her water pot first to be the first missionary, right, is the woman at the well. And that's such a poignant detail. I don't know if that's a laugh line or more of a poignant moment that her whole purpose in being there was to get water, but she leaves the water pot to go, to go in effect, preach the gospel and be the first missionary in John's gospel. And then Luke also has many powerful stories about women. All the material about Mary is there, uh, strong emphasis on widows and orphans. Uh, the powerful scene with Mary and Martha, the powerful scene where this woman from the crowd says, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which thou hast sucked. And Jesus says, no, rather blessed are those that hear the word of God and keep it, which is really challenging statement on a variety of levels, but I think also really powerful and interesting. So I see each of the gospel writers emphasizing women's interactions with Jesus, but doing it in different ways. So those of, uh, I, I'm sitting here debating if I should say this, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> but um, um, I'm thinking about missionaries. I'm thinking about um, women. But um, those of us who are, are women who do this kind of work um, are fond of saying the first theologian was a woman. That was Eve who argued with God. Um, the first preacher was a woman who preached the resurrection, and the first missionary was a woman. So um, what have we been missing? <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, Jacob has you have a question. Maybe we can do one more and end on your note, not mine. That would be better. <laughs> um, Julie, you're doing a great job of illuminating some of these stories of women that are often overlooked. Um, and I think you've provided a good model for approaching those. So for those who are reading this book devotionally, who are reading other books in the New Testament, how can, you know, everyday readers, what, what can they do to 
better understand these stories of women and do more with them? Uh, what, what would you suggest? What are some tools for, 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 for common readers approaching the New Testament? How can they examine and do the sort of things that, that you do with this text uh, in terms of the stories of women, hold up those stories and, and find ways to live them in their lives and to share those stories and make others aware of those stories? That's such a good question. I think the short answer is you need to be ready to do a lot of work yourself. And I will share this story. Um, years ago when my kids were young and we wanted visual aids to teach them Bible stories, I really wanted to teach them the story of the daughters of Zelophehad, which I know every single one of you knows that story in and out because it's so famous. Um, it should be. It's the only time the law of Moses gets changed, and it gets changed because women asked for it to be changed. So we all know that story because it's so important, right? Well, it actually turns out that even on the internet, and this was probably 10, 15 years ago, maybe it's different now, I literally could not find a visual representation of this story, like a coloring book page or you know anything for children. Nothing, like literally nothing. Fortunately, my husband has reasonable art skills, and so I'm like, all right, I need an illustration so we can show it to the kids. Did I do that? Sorry. So we can do the story. But I think you just have to be willing to work, and part of that work is not just drawing the picture yourself so you have a visual aid, but part of that work is not just accepting the fact that you should skip this story because everybody else skips this story but of doing the work to say, what's going on in the story? Why might I want to teach it to my children? What can they learn from it about how you interact with religious authority, which is a very trenchant question for a lot of people. So honestly, I think most of the work is just being open to the idea that there may be more to the story than you have been led to believe and really putting in the effort of not just academic study, but also prayer and pondering and religious devotion to try to figure out what we could learn from that story if we were willing to put the time in. And I, and I would put in a plug for this, uh, for this book, which is for sale back there. Um, not because I'm getting money for it, but... but it's okay, but I'm not thing, either. Yeah, that's right. Oh, okay, good. So we're in, in the same boat. Um, but the thing, one of the things I appreciate about it so much is... Um, the way that you take a text and then show all the different possible ways to look at it. So it might be literary, it might be looking at um, the silencing, it might be the Greek, um, you know, comparing the Greek, it might be looking at um, what, what um, traditionally LDS um, commentators may have said or the elders may have said about this. So, um, and then you, and then there is no answer. And that's what, it's really a wonderful volume in that way. So devotionally, you can struggle with it, and you can think about which pieces of these um, resonate with me. And I think that's a really powerful, I mean, what, what I was saying is, it, and I'm not a member of the church, but it's one that I'll use, because there's so much rich material in there, as maybe I'm preparing to speak about um, some verses in Mark, and just to say these are different ways you can look at things and allow people to struggle for themselves. So that's, I think that's very, very powerful, and it's a wonderful way you've laid it out. Yeah, it, it, with early readers, they either loved the lists or they hated them, and I really tried to make converts to the lists. And the reason I did that is because I feel, and the classic example of this is you open the New Testament, you look at that list of names in Matthew 1, and you turn the page for Christmas, because who wants to read a genealogy, right? I mean, it's just boring, and there's nothing there. Well, that's not even remotely true. Matthew's genealogy is fascinating, and there's tons of really interesting stuff in there to chew on. But if you come at it with this approach of like, yeah, yeah, list of names, nothing to see here, let's move along, you aren't going to get anything out of it. And I would say that any text that you approach with a surety that you already know what it means, you're not going to learn anything from, because you have already announced that you already know what it means. And so what I'm trying to do is open up options and say, here's a list of a dozen or so things that the dove descending at the baptism might symbolize. I'm not going to tell you which one is right, because frankly, I have no idea. But I want you to put in the effort of pondering, praying over, thinking through, okay, if the dove symbolizes this, what does that imply about Jesus' baptism? And what does that imply about my own baptism or the practice of baptism today? And so what I'm trying to do is present tools that encourage someone to grapple themselves and find their own answers. 
um, instead of just saying, here's what the dove symbolizes. Because if you already know what the dove symbolizes, your mind, I think, shuts down. Whereas I think if you open your mind to, huh, I wonder what that means, or oh, I never really thought of it that way, we would say in the Latter-day Saint tradition that you are opening some room for the spirit to speak to you and tell you something you didn't already know by approaching in a more open way. Well, let's thank Julie for being here. Thank you.